<laughs> we're all together. But for today, I might just go through them. I'll just go through the motions. And if it seems a little distracting or a little uh, disoriented, it's it's just kind of out of not enough planning on my side, but I'm, I'm happy to at least do it. And maybe next time we'll all have the same bottle and the same jars. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. I'm hoping that we'll, that this will be the first of the visits with you here. The two that I brought, I have this one from Hydrant. I don't know if you guys ever get down here, but there is a label that's not too far from where I'm at in San Francisco. And they have a uh, a bunch of really nice single source uh, meads. And so I'll, I'll mention that. I probably won't. Um, Mark, you're, you're uh, frozen. There's Christy's little bee butt. <laughs> Mark, you're frozen. Hi. <laughs> I think when someone gets frozen, there's not a lot they can do about it. Oh. You plugged the camera in? Yeah, okay. I'm good. Right. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> so does he need to restart? Hmm? Hi, I, Eva. Don't, good to I see don't you. know the answer to that. In the past, it, they've just eventually become unfrozen. Oh, oh, here we go. Membership. He went away. He's coming back. Hi, Eva. Hi. Can, can, can you flash the membership again? Um, I just have it in the chat. Um, so go into the chat and it'll be there. It'll be the first um, first uh, chat. Okay. All right. Look, Thank you. Right, so you, you don't like it? I didn't think it was quite done. No, 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 membership right here. Oh, down the bottom. Yeah, man. 25. Official. 25. Okay. And it's, it's not due until January. So it's okay. just bring it out there for people. Thank you. <laughs> uh, do y'all have video on me? Yes. Okay. You're back. Excellent. Thank you. It says over in the participants panel that Eric Christian is here, but where is Larry? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Take this off. Yeah, Larry. So maybe this is the quintessential apple harvest week or handful of weeks is now a, uh, I've sure been picking them off a few trees here, but we only got a, a, a dozen or two. We didn't get much of a, a large, we only have a couple, uh, neighbors only have a couple trees, but I have had a few friends that went to an orchard to go through the motions. Well, if you come up here, we can um, have many samples of cider for you. <laughs> Janine, I was reflecting on when I was uh, uh, just a young person in New York, uh, I was small enough that I was, I was the youngest of three kids and I would be sent up into the tree to shake it. So my responsibility uh -huh. was to climb as high as I could and shake as much as I could to get the apples to fall out of the tree for other siblings to hopefully not throw them up at me or something, try and knock me down. But uh, just to go shake, I was a little guy who was good at shaking. So I haven't done that in a lot of years. Boy, that sounds like a really fun job. <laughs> You'd get up there and you could pick your favorite apple, make sure it tasted the way you wanted. You know, you could really dial in on what flavors you're getting in your cider. Wow. Yes. We've got several different kinds of apple trees and, and we do cider every year. And it's just always, it's nicer to mix the flavors. And, and it's really fun to just see the different apples that how the different apples taste differently and and ripen at different times. <laughs> I made some uh, two kinds of applesauce. One was uh, the flesh was pink, and as I uh, cooked it, it stayed pink. So I have pink applesauce and um, traditional yellow applesauce. Really good. Put it in the nice. freezer. Very tasty. No additions. Nothing. 
What's the, what's the name of that pink apple? Uh, I got it from Ann Lindsay, so I don't know. Do you know, Janine, what the name of that apple was? I'm not sure which one she had. Um, there, you know, there is a, a famous one that has pink flesh. Um, and it's not pink lady, but pink, pink pearl. pearl, pink pearl, pink pearl. Thank pink you. Pearl. From uh, is, that's an edder variety. Right. It's very tasty, very sweet. It didn't add anything to it. Where I went to my undergrad, we had a. a one of those uh, uh, dispensers, they're like a food dispenser, typically for sandwiches or other types of food. And they filled it entirely with different types of apples, New York, uh, Ithaca. So Cornell had such a pride in, in their yeah. various, uh, that they, they put it on display. So you could go up with a, I don't know, 50 cents or something would buy it and you could buy six different types of apples. And uh, we'd also do uh, interesting that New York as an undergrad, we were doing uh, tasting combinations. That, Early in life, I was interested in how you could pair it with uh, mostly just with cheeses, like you'd have a different cheese for a different apple and we'd cut them all into different slices and go through it and yeah. think that we had a conclusion, but usually just ate a bunch of cheese and apples and enjoyed them all. So it looks like it's six o'clock. Uh, Chris, are you ready to take her? Sure. A sure. Um, I'm sure that for the next few minutes, we'll have uh, several people pop in and out, and Cheryl mm -hmm. will let them in. Um, I'm Chris House. Eric's here, but he's a little under the weather, so I get to be the, the president today. Ho, ho. You have to tolerate me. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. We have a great speaker. Um, we're lucky that Janine uh, made the inquiry and Mark said yes. So look forward to uh, pretend drinking mead, but we'll learn how to make it. I'll just tell you a little bit of how we're gonna work our meeting tonight. Um, we'll have a little bit of business and then um, Janine will introduce Mark, give a little bit of CV for him. Then afterwards, we'll have a little question and answer um, about the presentation, which will be a little more than an hour, perhaps in that category of time frame. And then um, we'll have our regular beekeeper Q&A. And then when we're done answering and asking questions, we'll be done for the evening. So um, I'll let you know what uh, we discussed at our last board of directors meeting. Eric, uh, our president, um, made and created uh, some really beautiful certificates to thank the uh, Eureka Natural Foods and Ace Hardware for uh, their rounding up uh, program that they presented money to us. It was at least $3,000 for Ace and I can't quite remember the number for Eureka Natural Foods. It was closer to four and a half or something, wasn't it? Does anybody on the board remember that number? You know, I think we got about the same amount from each one. Okay, thanks, Janine. Um, so uh, Eric made them and delivered them. So that was really nice that he was able to accomplish that task. Um, we had a honey harvest early in September and uh, Donna Blair was the chairwoman for that event at the brewery in Blue Lake. I don't know if Donna's here yet. No, she's not. Well, thank you to John Donna for the, all the hard work and we didn't have a lot of people, but we had a lot of fun. And, and there was a lot of honey that was extracted. So yay, yay for us. It was a great day. We didn't have a lot of trouble with bees um, coming in, just maybe a couple of them. Uh, one of the other things we discussed at our board meeting is starting um, a rotating queen bank program next year. It would be available to the members and uh, it would rotate to different beekeepers yards and we would uh, have a selection of queens available for a few months of the early beekeeping um, season. So we don't have to always have um, an emergency. Oh my goodness, where's the bees? I need a queen, blah, blah, blah. So 
Uh, we haven't discovered, I mean, we haven't discussed what we're really going to do, but we want to do it. We think it would be a helpful thing. And uh, it would be available to people who are members. So that's another benefit. You obviously have to pay for the, for the queen, but you wouldn't have to um, wait. It would be in our community. It would be right there. Thank you. <laughs> and then I uh, just wanted to let everybody know that membership renewal um, starts in January and you can send it in anytime. You can go up to do your membership um, on the website. We have a couple of people that need to um, close their mute. Close their, let's see. Yeah, thank you. Yay. Um, membership uh, is a calendar year for the um, Humboldt Beekeepers, uh, Humboldt County Beekeepers, and it's $20 for individuals and $25 for um, families. And you can use snail mail. I put the address for the PO box in the chat, the first, uh, first chat message. So you can access that information there, or you can renew online. And um, we haven't decided whether we're going to send emails out, but you can tickle yourself and send it in early if you care to. Uh, we have some swag, and uh, this year we sold quite a bit of it, so we only have a little bit. So I have a little display here for you. This is the um, the canvas bag, and it's twenty dollars. And here's a, a hoodie. It's really thick, nice logo, and it has a uh, pocket. I'm not going to model it. And then here's our baseball t-shirt. It's a uh, gray and then the arms are black. And these, this is 25. The hoodie is 40 and the canvas bag is 20. And we have maybe a couple of these left and we have some mediums and larges of the sweatshirts or hoodies. And we have medium and large for the t-shirts. And we intend to uh, order some new swag. We'll make those decisions later. You guys have any ideas of what you'd like to have? Be sure to let us know. Send it to the humble beekeepers at gmail.com. And let's see. Um, we're going to have the board of directors is going to have an annual planning session uh, in. Uh, maybe a week or so. So if you guys have any ideas of what you would like to see for speakers next year, be sure to let us know. And that's what we do at the end of the year is we try to plan for speakers for the, for the full year. If you have people that you'd like to have speak or specific, specific topics that you'd like to have us um, try to get a speaker for, please let us know. And uh, let's see, the uh, California Master Beekeepers program testing uh, for the candidates for apprentice. Um, I think most of them are done. I don't know if everybody's completely finished with their uh, testing, but most of us are. And then um, Eric was, uh, Eric is our cutout king. He does a lot of cutouts. And if you look at our Facebook page, you get to see for the last few months, some of the amazing cutouts that he's done. And so he uh, provided us with a person and company called Publix, I say green, Blue Green Horizons. And they, they do public space swarms, cutouts and post removal and do it yourself. So he was hoping that he could get them to be our speaker for next month. So that if anybody has any questions, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll let Janine introduce our speaker. I got a quick one. Um, when you want membership sent in, if we send checks, who are they made to? Um, HCBA, Humboldt County Beekeepers Association. Okay. Well, John Winsler, you can send them all to John Winsler too. <laughs> <laughs> You want like about 10 years of subscription money up front, right? Yeah, yeah. You get a discount, 10% discount. 
All right, that was very good. Any other questions? All right, so Janine, you're on. Okay, well, it is my pleasure to introduce Mark Carlson. I first met him back in 2016 when I was taking the um, some classes at the California Master Beekeeping Program um, at UC Davis. And you know, he's you know really fun to talk with. But I've learned a lot more about him. I've learned that. You know, he comes from a family of biologists and naturalists um, and really started uh, his beekeeping on the East Coast when he was an uh, uh, undergraduate at the Cornell University, which makes me wonder if he met Dr. Tom Seeley. He spent his, uh, he was studying social insects as part of his studies and uh, did field work in the summers. Um, he's also had, he's had such a life, so many, like many lives in one. He um, was, you know, studying water systems and, and then he went to Peace Corps in El Salvador from 2005 to 2007. And um, as part of his uh, community agriculture mm -hmm. work, he was taking care of honeybees. Now that, those would be Africanized honeybees. And then he came back and, you know, in 2016, he was taking the, started taking the, the California Master Beekeeping Program. And he graduated with John Wensler in the inaugural class of 2019. So he keeps bees in San Francisco. He's been teaching classes on beekeeping at all levels down there. Um, and he also has become an expert in honey. He's the co-chair of the Good Food Awards honey competition where they get honey from all over. And uh, he especially likes monofloral honeys. Um, we'll have to find out how the honey competition was this year. Um, and he's currently working as a chemist for a small company. So he is doing electrochemistry and disinfection research. So he knows all about the various methods for sanitizing brew equipment. Um, and he did a really, really outstanding class on uh, introduction to me for the California Master Beekeeping Program this year. In fact, it was because of attending that class that I reached out to Mark Carlson and asked him if he would be um, generous in coming and talking with us. And he is a very generous man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'd like you to meet um, Mark Carlson and we'll hear more about um, exploring nectar, honey, and mead with him. Nectar, honey, and mead. Thank you, Janine. What, what did I say? Uh, ne nectar, honey, and mead sounds great. Okay. And I, I didn't spend much time with Tom Seeley when I was an undergrad. I was taking beekeeping classes, and I've reconnected him with him recently, but more about where he was doing his research, and then I also knew some of those forests around uh, Ithaca, New York, and so it's been a fun, a fun connection from Cornell, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll mention some of the Peace Corps stuff and uh, a little bit about Arizona and uh, a perfect introduction. And I am happy to talk about honey all the time. I, I did just finish that Good Food Awards. And, uh, and so I've got plenty of jars lying around my apartment and enjoying lots of different types. And if we're all set, I guess I, I could go right ahead and dive in and share my screen if it's appropriate. Do it. Do it, cool. 
Okay, and maybe Janine, I can see you. If you can wave and give me a thumbs up that you're you're looking at what I'm looking at. Good. Okay. Ooh. Sorry, not to preview all of this, but let me get to the beginning. Start at the beginning. Cool. And maybe I can just get one more thumbs up, uh, Janine, if you got what I've got on my screen. Awesome. Great. A great introduction. I really appreciate it. I am really glad to be here. I, I love talking about this stuff. And I did actually open a, a glass. If anybody else has theirs, we can lift our meet up and cheers to October 7th. And so a perfect introduction, Janine, you got it straight. Um, I do want to go through just a little bit about the background of some of the prerequisites to the mead, um, some of my thoughts on um, detective work and identifying floral origins of honey, especially associated with single source uh, monofloral honey. Uh, I do work in a lab, and so I will go a little bit into not only sensory analysis, which I can do right now and we all can enjoy a little bit of, but also some of the laboratory analysis as well. And then I'll end on brew equipment, which as Janine clearly said, I, I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about why bacteria don't die when I want them to. They're, they're tough and they're confusing and, and it's a fun, maybe like brewing mead is also somewhat less predictable than you might guess. And so that'll be my, that'll be the segue into mead and mead production, mead making would be uh, thinking about uh, sanitization, which I'll bring up at the end. And to get started, uh, I do really love single source honey. And then it segues into something called single or monofloral honey that is fermented into mead. And so you could have something called a monofloral mead. And I have an example bottle here from Hydrin. It's also on the screen. Um, the bottle that I have is from Carrot Blossoms. I think it might even be, it's somewhere from the Pacific Northwest. And, uh, and just as maybe a general framework, there's a whole lot of really delicious mead and I'm learning to appreciate a lot of other types, but I've been focused on monofloral honey because of another interest is Good Food Awards. And so it's taken me toward monofloral uh, mead making. And, and that's been a fun, a been a fun riddle. The other uh, mead that I'll mention while I get started though is, uh, um, this is out of Vermont. It's also on the screen there. That's the one that I'm drinking and it's a good recommendation if anybody is curious to try another flavor. Uh, the three books there and this quote from uh, uh, Chrissy Zerpour is, uh, she spoke at Davis a while ago and, and I think that it nicely captures what I'm talking about here that even if you're just starting to make mead, maybe the simplest option could be with some of these early, just make a very, uh, a single varietal, try and focus on just that flavor. And as you get good at that, then you can add a lot more on top of it. But maybe like uh, cider, we were talking about the ways in which flavors can complement themselves. And I started with just the simplest in order, in order to kind of isolate the, the methods that I was working on. And so that'll be a theme as I go forward. One other quick thing on this slide, I am going to be uh, showing some of the pollen grains that I've collected. Well, not that I've, some that I've collected, but most that I've taken off the internet. And that's gonna be this theme of how can you identify what your initial nectar source, your botanical origin was. And so pollen as well as nectar really provide some interesting clues on how you can do that. To just get to the, the essence of it, monofloral, when I use that term, I'm referring to a, a type of honey that's been predominantly collected by the bees from one type of plant. And so that doesn't often exist outside of agriculture. And so if you have, I have this bottle here called carrot blossom, and that would mean that that honey was collected from a field of carrots. And, and I think that's all pretty familiar to us, but how the specific different, how you might differentiate some of the other, or how you might define it gets a little bit tricky as well, because you might, different people have different opinions on it, and maybe I'll just leave it at that. Um, but really specifically, when I think about monofloral honey, it also is an interesting thing that that nectar has a very specific sugar concentration, which is an actual reflection of the pollen origin. And so even at that beginning level, just the type of sugars that are in nectar are characteristic of the specific plant species that they came from. And so again, I'll be referring to these clues that a detective might do if you wanted to try and identify not only the, the types of honey that you might have in your hives right now, but also when you're trying to think about it as a culinary thing. It, it is interesting to think that some flavors are gonna come out with more with different species and so a different plant species. So, and it's detectable by taste, which is really fun. 
as Janine mentioned, I do have a background. Uh, I, I have a degree in ecology. My brother and sister are both ecologists and my dad is a fish biologist and my mom is a naturalist, worked in public school. Um, so 2012, I was doing field research with my sister. She studied evolution and ecology, uh, ecology and evolutionary biology. And she was doing her field research or postdoc work in South Africa. And so she was looking at a very specific type of protea flower and it was up on the top of this mountain. And I've been doing that type of thing my whole life. And so it feels pretty natural, but in the context of this talk, it really just is a good example of not only do uh, insect pollinated nectar, excuse me, insect pollinated uh, flowers have nectar that is specific to them. You can actually identify the type of plant from the sugar concentrations if they're bird pollinated or bat pollinated. And so flowers that are bird pollinated and bat pollinated typically have a higher uh, volume because they're bigger animals, but also they have a more dilute, they have a, a lower concentration of sugars. And so again, we're just kind of reemphasizing this idea that a lot of these characteristics are traceable back to the plant origin. My work in El Salvador, I had a really good time down there. I was an agriculture volunteer and uh, uh, El Salvador is a very densely populated place. It's got a lot of people and they, and so the landscape is very modified, very anthropogenically changed to accommodate all of the mostly sustenance agriculture, a lot of corn. But the cool thing about bees in El Salvador is that people also are quite, uh, the tropics, you can grow a lot of really interesting fruit. And so horticulture and fruit production was also a big part of life down there. And the ways in which bees were used is a lot of fun for me to think about. And so specifically, I grew this one type of tree in my yard, the cashew uh, cashew tree, and that's called the marignon. And the bees also like that. Um, and the other plant that I have that my bees also, I was doing some pollination work with bees and another crop, which I didn't label it here in this picture. Uh, I don't know if y'all can see it, the picture on the bottom with the big red berries, that's the clue. And uh, they were only grown in the higher alpine. That's actually the coffee plant. And so people who had coffee fingers would recruit beekeepers to put their hives in the coffee fincas in order to um, pollination, pollination services. They would actually get a larger yield of their fruit of the coffee bean. And then they'd also get uh, individual beans were larger if they were pollinated by bees. And so uh, the honeybee specifically and the Africanized honeybee was used for pollination similar to uh, how we might think of it up here. And then I also have one other little insect on my screen uh, right at the top of the screen, which is a uh, uh, it is a stingless bee, but it is a uh, it is social. It does live in a colony, and so there are people in Central America, and I got to see some of the hot the hives that they would use, and they date back to ancient civilization, Mayan and Aztec civilizations that actually kept these stingless bees before even the 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 uh, I guess Europeans would have brought the 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 first uh, honeybees to the United States, and so. Other um, uh, stingless bees were really interesting and fun to get to know. Very different, but uh, also really cool. And then the vocabulary word on the bottom, polylectic, is just that honeybees are generalist pollinators. And so they are capable of foraging from different flowers. And that's really what's allowed them to have such success with humans is that we can put them in different environments and they do well based on a diversity of flowers, not so much that they're very specialized to one type of plant. But in uh, parallel, or I guess in contrast, there are lots of native pollinators that have specially evolved uh, to a specific type of flower. And so the two that I have here, actually the yellow-faced bumblebee is probably one that you might have up in Humboldt as well. We have a lot of this, this is our most common, sorry, that's right at the top of the screen, the yellow-faced bumblebee. And uh, um, it's also a generalist pollinator. It does visit a lot of different flowers, but we have a lot of them here in the Bay Area. And the photo I have there is, uh, this is actually, the, the landscape is, uh, looking at uh, Mount, Mount Tamapias in, Muir, in uh, Marin County and Muir Woods is right down below there. And so right at the top of Mount Tamapias, there's these, uh, uh, I've seen these, in fact, I just, I photographed that very, uh, that Calypso orchid. And, and it turns out when the yellow-faced bumblebee goes to visit that, the orchid is actually quite stingy in its uh, production of nectar. And so it actually achieves pollination through something called, well, through deception. It actually is able to recruit pollinators based on its appearance, not necessarily its production of nectar. And still it is able to be, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's why they're so rare, but it is an interesting ecological niche that they've established with uh, their pollination process. 
And then the other native pollinator is one I'm really, really fond of as well, because I've been able to capture this, uh, this habropoda, habropoda, which is uh, uh, it's a, a digger bee. And so this one in particular is called the silver digger, and it lives in the sand and it's specialized to dune uh, sand environments. And those don't exist regularly in San Francisco, but there have been some restoration, some dune restoration efforts that they've been able to restore some of these populations. And I was able to capture one in my neighborhood. I contacted a local USDA uh, uh, entomologist and she and I went out and captured them together, confirmed the sighting, and then were able to celebrate it because she has received attention based on some of these dune restoration uh, projects and how this one charismatic little bee is making a rebound and all of a sudden it might give people a reason why dunes have a have an important role even if we're living in a dense city uh, interesting how they they might be able to get a little win for um, for restoration efforts and they're very fond of the of lupin plants which I'm sure you all have up there too and and again I, I kind of snuck in these pollen grains just because they're of my they're on my mind and and so each one of these plants has the specific pollen grain so I put the lupin pollen grain on there as well. Main takeaway from these first couple ecology slides is that as you all probably do, it's good to know your nectar. And if you're not very familiar with your nectar, it's not necessarily an overwhelming task to try and get to know your nectar. And the way that I found to know mine would be to just isolate the types of flower that bees are visiting based on a list, a common list of what, uh, what we have in the area. And then observing, thinking about the abundance, taking walks around my area, the local green spaces that I know the bees are visiting. And to have the confirmation and actually see my honeybees on those plants is a, is a really great confirmation. And then even more so when I'm able to uh, actually collect some of that pollen from my hive and confirm those sightings. And so uh, getting to know your nectar is a really interesting and fun challenge. If you haven't started it, uh, it's worth it. And uh, We've, I've heard UC Davis has got quite a reputation amongst your crowd already. And so there, Amina Harris is doing really great things to define those flowers and those honeys that are being produced in different areas. And the National Honey Board also has their, um, has their list of, of various, uh, various flora that they know to be popular for honeybees. And then maybe one other quick thought on this is just that we do have various types of, uh, we have different regions completely across the other side of the country. We have citrus growing in Florida. and those are identical in their botanical uh, description, but sometimes it's the, the moisture and the, the seasonality and some of these other qualities that might make the honey slightly different. And so it's not just purely nectar that defines your honey, even though we can agree that it would be the vast majority of the flavors if you're talking about a monofloral honey production, you can define a lot based on the species, but there's also something to be said about the geography or the actual location where that, where that plant, plant was grown. Uh, nothing much new on this slide for y'all. I think that we can all agree that we know nectar to be quite dilute. It's got a lot of water in it. And so that small pie chart is just to show that 75% of nectar is water and the bees carry it back to the hive in that concentration. And then they pass it to each other through trophallaxis. They put it in their mouth parts and then uh, share it with another bee. And in doing so, they're uh, they're removing, they're evaporating some of that water, they're dehydrating some of that water, and maybe some of that water is consumed, but it's also just the process of maybe like a cow chewing on their cud. They're moving it around, they're passing it back and forth, and in doing so, they're also introducing kind of their own suite of uh, uh, enzymes and, and microbiology, bacteria, um, and so all of those things are really interesting um, in that they are then expressed later in the uh, actual honey. And so once the bees have dehydrated that nectar down to 18%, that's when it gets capped. Again, a story that I'm all, I'm sure we're all mostly familiar with. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's all I'll say about ripening honey. Uh, once the honey is defined, at 18% is defined, then you can observe it as we all have a jar of honey, you hold it up to the light and you can observe that different types of honey do have different color. And specifically, they have a, a different absorbance. And so the ways in which the light is interacting with honey is based on um, the particular molecules and the quantity, the, 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 the concentration of the molecules that are in there. And specifically, if the molecules have these conjugated double bonds, then they are more likely to absorb the light. And so we know that darker honey has a higher concentration of these molecules with the, the conjugated double bonds. And what I also find really interesting is some of these 
bond, the, these molecules are made by the plant for sometimes for a defense, but a lot of times, well, a few times, they actually provide a lot of flavor and sometimes other colors as well. And so I listed some of those uh, underneath the second bullet point there. I list flavonoids and terpenes because not only do they have an impact on the way in which we can observe the honey, the color of honey, but they also are the ones that bring a lot of, of interesting uh, aroma and flavors to the honey that we can then later taste. And I also mentioned on this slide the um, this other metrics by which we're able to evaluate honey. And I, I'm sure some of you have heard about it, but it's kind of a confusing one, more of an arbitrary scale. And so dark honey is higher on this P fund scale. And that's just based on this uh, uh, a standard glass uh, wedge that's amber glass. And so as you go up higher on the wedge, you get more of the amber glass. And so just as a reference point on how a lot of people will talk about uh, uh, the color of honey. Uh, the couple of the pictures there, that black locust is where my where I grew up and where my mom is, and she gets a really nice light honey from uh, the black locust. And then I've gotten both fennel and uh, blackberry honey in San Francisco, and they have nice color, darker color as well, usually a darker amber. And that said, I'm going to uh, encourage y'all, like I, I told John and uh, Janine earlier, I'm going to go through these motions. If you had a jar of honey, I would encourage you to grab it at this point and just to practice a protocol that I use when I'm working with honey judges. And so I've been responsible to train honey judges as they're evaluating, um, evaluating different samples. And so I'm gonna grab my jars right here and, uh, and we'll go through this together. I actually have them sitting on a little heater behind me and so they're nice and warm, but that really provides a, a, a nice release of the volatile uh, aromatics. And so if you do heat up your honey before you taste it, you get a whole lot more of the various smells and the flavors will be a lot stronger. And so mine, uh, I have right in front of me this, uh, I have a citrus. And so again, the protocol that I'll be going through involves um, taking a first, a real nice smell of the honey before you taste it, um, covering my entire tongue and thinking about not only am I gonna really hit the front of my tongue to get the sweetness, but sometimes I actually avoid the tip of my tongue in order to avoid really sweetness. And so I sometimes I'll if I know that, like, for example, I have this citrus honey, I know it's going to be really sweet because it does have a higher fructose content. Sometimes I'll think to myself that I'll actually put it past my tongue, the tip of my tongue, in order to get a little bit deeper. Uh, you can also engage, you can engage your retronasal senses by inhaling through your mouth and exhaling through your nose. Um, and then I also have this comment to write notes. And uh, if you all haven't thought about it or you all haven't done it yet, Amina Harris is, is my mentor in a lot of honey thing, things that are honey. Uh, I've learned most of what I know about honey from her, and if anybody hasn't had the chance to talk to her or spend a little time with her or think about what she does with honey, uh, I don't think you would regret it. I think it's really worth it, and I've really enjoyed it. So that said, yeah, so again, I have my jar of uh, citrus honey. It's actually produced out of Davis and part of Amina Harris's tasting program. And so again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take a real nice first smell of this, and it's, it's really nice and warm. I've had it sitting on the heater behind me. And so I'm already getting just, uh, I think of like a nice floral, a really nice bright, bright flavor, almost like a sweet, like I mentioned here, like a really nice jasmine. And so how that is just even so evident, uh, right? Even from before I even take a taste, I'm getting some of that nice, uh, just fruity and, fr and bright flavors. And so I like to differentiate that from some of the darker flavors, which will be the second one that I'll go through. And again, mine is a real nice liquid, a nice, real clear color. It's a really it's not an amber at all. It's, I call it a blonde, and, uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and go go for a taste. If you all have one and you wanted to join me, that'd be fun. But otherwise, at least you know <laughs> you've at least seen me do it. I'm I'm demonstrating. And then a lot of the a lot of the aroma can be verified by this by by the taste of this single this kind of monofloral citrus honey. It's got just a whole lot of sweet, a whole lot of nice mellow, uh, but but I think a fruity and crisp. Um, I really like Amina once mentioned that sometimes she gets a little hint of anise and anise is a flavor that I'm really, really fond of because of my fennel plants. And so that's a great example of not only getting some of the sweetness, but also then engaging in your retronasal, thinking about a little bit more of the aroma that you might be getting from the honey after you get past your, after you get past your tongue. And interesting enough, I really warm these up. So they're, they're really liquidy and, uh, anyway, for better or for worse. <laughs> Uh, I do also mention here this 80, 38% uh, fructose, and I'll go into that just a little bit more, but 
maybe the reason I'll mention it right now is because citrus has a higher than average uh, fructose content, that also is a real clear, easy first order flavor. If you put it in your mouth and the first thing you think of is that was really sweet, there are honeys that aren't always that sweet. And so how that fructose content is, is, is displayed, is reflected, and, and you get to taste it is a real easy, I think of the sweetness factor is, is a little easier to talk about than some of the other uh, retronasal and some of the extra uh, flavors, some of the other aromas that you might get. So my second honey, um, which if you do have a chance to do a tasting, and I'm sure a lot of you already have, is um, having something in contrast and, and it allows, and I'm sure they do this with wine and all kinds of other interesting things to flavor, to enjoy flavors of is if you can allow yourself the opportunity to really compare it to something that's really different than it, it allows the first one to kind of highlight those elements. And so the second one I have, which again has been warming for a while is, is, is uh, uh, I like caramel, I get caramel. Um, Oh, it's great. I mean, I love it. It's earthy. It's not nearly as bright and it's a lot darker. And so I, and I know this one, I've had it a few times. It is quite a fun flavor that isn't so sweet. Uh, and again, this is cardamom, this is cilantro, and it is, uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, oh, it's so good. It's delicious. And it's got all kinds of good peppers and, and, and cinnamon and, and nutmeg and, and all kinds of interesting like side side flavors that I really, I didn't get any of that really in the citrus. And so just as an example of two honeys, um, the coriander is a great example of something really nice and, and savory. Uh, buttery is a nice flavor profile. And if you all have a chance and you haven't gotten one yet, uh, Amina Harris does produce a flavor wheel and they're available for sale. And a lot of times when I'm using the flavor wheel, I'll actually think about it as hours on a clock. And so the first six hours of the clock are mostly uh, bright and floral and fruity flavors. And then the second six hours are more dark and earthy. And I like herbaceous, kind of grassy or, or, or leathery. And so a lot of those flavors come out in different types of honey. And uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. So tasting, Ruby. So as I mentioned, the maybe one of the easier parts of tasting honey and identifying the different flavors of honey can start with the sugars. And so as you get the different ratio of glucose to fructose, you will get an immediate response in your mouth of what you're getting. If you're getting a really sweet upfront, then that's typical, that's, that's definitive of the fructose. And if you're not getting that, that's typical of a higher uh, glucose content. So you can see the different numbers that I have listed here. Um, again, the citrus has got a higher fructose and not that the coriander has a really low fructose, but it has a lower relative amount of fructose. And uh, the other interesting thing is that the bees do intro introduce this invertase enzyme, and that allows the honey to have a lot of glucose and fructose because it actually originated from another sugar molecule, the sucrose, uh, sucrose molecule, which is actually broken in half during the process of the bees introducing the enzyme to it. And so that's how we can go from 75% water to uh, 18% water and all of that other sugar could have been, or a large part of the fructose and glucose could have been originating from the initial concentration of sucrose that was in the nectar. I also uh, list two uh, instruments on my screen here, um, or just one, it's a refractometer. And in general, if you're gonna be doing mead making, it is nice to have a, a refractometer that is more appropriate for, uh, um, for mead making is a percent sugar range from zero to 32. Whereas if you're analyzing honey, you want a refractometer that's measuring sugar levels from 60 to 80%. And so those are two different devices. Those are two, typically two different instruments. And so you would wanna make sure you had the right one for the type of uh, either honey or nectar, depending on what you're measuring. And here are a couple of examples, other examples of really nice sweet honey. I did mention black locust from New York. Uh, Clover's really got some nice sweetness. Uh, sage, I, I struggle with sage. I really do like sage honey, but I find it, I don't know if I'd say it's really uh, extra sweet up front, even though it does have a high fructose content because it does have a lot of other, maybe it's got like a lot of uh, these other flavor compounds that make it really interesting and complicated. And so, um, but in general, rule of thumb, fructose, higher fructose content is a, is a lot sweeter. And you can actually look up all of these numbers if you think you have a potential uh, influence on your honey and you wanna do a quick Google search. There are, the, there are people that have done uh, 
that have researched this and they've put together tables of the various uh, different uh, group fructo fructose and glucose ratios for all the different uh, single source honeys. The really interesting thing about glucose is not so much, in my opinion, about its flavor, but it is uh, fascinating that it is the molecule that typically results in the honey crystallizing. And so the glucose molecule is a lot less soluble than the fructose molecule. And so it comes out of solution at a, at a quicker rate. And we all know, well, honey, honey is a super saturated solution. And so it has more sugar in it than would typically be there. And so that makes it somewhat unstable of a liquid. And therefore, as soon as that, if you have a lot of glucose, if you have uh, seed, uh, crystal seeds, things that the crystals can grow on. And sometimes I just don't filter my honey very much. And so I often get crystallization partially because of the glucose, but also partially because I've got a lot of other small particulate in there that the, the sugar crystals can grow on. Uh, and so um, I've looked at this. I like glucose molecules. I thought about, I work in a lab. And so I did talk to my supervisor, who's a, a, a photophysicist. And so he reminded me to look at glucose molecules under a uh, polarized light. And if anybody is a science teacher or wants to look at uh, glucose molecules, you can make a little slide and using little polarized lens, you can actually get this uh, really beautiful rainbow effect of glucose. And so in addition to its, its crystalline structure, it also has some photo optic kind of cool properties that uh, are just interesting and fun if you're so inclined. And the other really, I guess the other major analytical thing with honey that I've gotten into lately has been pollen. And pollen does have a lot of flavor if you eat it straight, but in general, it's not a huge influence on the honey flavor. Um, the reason that I'm really excited about pollen is that you can isolate and identify it from a honey product. You can isolate and identify it from your hives when they're bringing it in. If you have a pollen trap, it's really easy to just set. And I have a photo and in this slide here, you might see that I do display my uh, preferred uh, pollen trap. They're really inexpensive and it allows you to do kind of a quick check at any point in the year. I just throw it on there for an afternoon, collect the maybe, I don't know, I only need a dozen or two pollen grains. And in addition to looking at the specific nectar or looking at the specific plant origin, I have gotten really interested in thinking about nutrition of bees and how you can do a qualitative check of that pollen by just determining the diversity of pollen that they're bringing in. And so if you look at your pollen grains and they, the pollen uh, uh, pellets, and they have, uh, sometimes I like, I think of it like, a, uh, uh, yeah, the, the diversity. If I can see three different colors or five different colors that look like different types of pollen pellets, then that's a really good indication that your bees are foraging from various different plants. And that's a good sign that they're also able to get uh, kind of a balanced nutrition. I, I guess I was thinking of a, of a cornucopia, like a holiday Thanksgiving cornucopia of like various different things all kind of lumped together. And so when I, harvested some pollen a week or so ago, I was really glad to see that diversity, see those various different types. Uh, that oxalis, so I've, I've, I've seen the bees on eucalyptus and definitely on fennel, and I have gone hunting for the fennel both in my honey and, and from my bees. And then oxalis was a little bit more of a tricky one, but I did have some curiosity because we had such a, a prolific uh, springtime bloom of uh, I don't know. It looks kind of, it's, it's like a false clover. I don't know if I'm explaining that very clearly, but the yellow flower on my screen is a real popular one. It's an invasive species and really interesting too. All three plants on my screen, none of them are native. And so I've been thinking more about what the role of non-native species can have on my bees. And the honest truth is it's, it's, it's significant. There are more non-native flowering plants than there are native flowering plants in my vicinity. And so I'm thinking a lot more about those non-native plants, but not necessarily in a bad way, but thinking about how they also can fill out the annual calendar for nectar sources. And I think about them, celebrate them in some of, somewhat of a similar way as I would with uh, the native plants, knowing that they unfortunately also typically outcompete and, and make it so that there are, there are fewer native plants available for the bees. But I still, I still like it in the context of uh, nutrition and uh, pollen supplies. And then I also mentioned here in the upper corner of my screen, there are a few organizations that will do this analysis. Uh, QSI is a laboratory, I think it's out of San Diego, it's in Southern California, and they'll run your honey sample and provide you with a pie chart of the various pollen grains in your honey for $100. And then there's also uh, a gentleman 
named Vaughn Bryant out of Texas A&M. And he's, he's as, in my opinion, as uh, proficient and, and influential on the, in the field of this Melissa palynology, this um, looking at pollen, Melissa, Melissa being of honey and palynology being the study of pollen grains. And so Melissa palynology is a discipline that's quite uh, eclectic, but is in my opinion, also a really cool one. I, I just like looking at the pollen grains and I really love this detective work. And there are a few people, some in UC Davis, some in, in Southern California, and then this gentleman, Vaughn Bryant and his lab in Texas that they're, they're, doing, they're doing a lot of really interesting, cool things. And I'm excited to continue to communicate with them when I have a few new ideas and questions. And I've, I mentioned I work in a lab. I do spend time with a microscope and I think of a real rough and dirty introduction to anyone who might be curious about pollen as being able to make these slides. And it's not, uh, maybe it's a good science, uh, science classroom activity and it's good to have an idea. And I also am kind of curious about how easy it would be for beekeepers to be able to at least prepare the slides if not identify the pollen on them. And so I've been kind of pursuing what methods might be easily accessible to a wider audience. And I'll just leave it at that. And if I come up with a really good idea one of these days and I can share it with Janine, she can be my liaison to pass it along to y'all. But in general, right now, what I'm doing is a very basic method. Is, and I just collect the fresh pollen directly from the trap, spread it onto a pollen or onto a microscope slide. I use a little bit of this glycerol in order to provide a medium by which I can look at them. And then I use, I do upgrade some of my light uh, microscopes, I have some more powerful, higher powerful lamps that I can look at them with. And that's what, and UV is another character that I can kind of get in there. And, and it's enough for me to be entertained. And I'm getting closer to a point of where I might call uh, pollen identification. And really quick, a little bit more about analysis. Uh, there are methods by which you can send your samples to a lab and you can analyze specifically what uh, flavor molecules might be present. And I'm interested in this in the context of monofloral honey. And as I've mentioned before, I really do like this wild fennel because I've got a ton of it. I've got a lot of wild fennel in my nearby vicinity. And I know the bees like it as a late fall crop. And I'm about to harvest this weekend. I'm glad to hear that you guys had a good harvest yourselves. And um, so our beekeeping club provides as a extractor rental. And so I'll get that, uh, pick that up on Friday. And and if I can get some of this dark anise honey, it'll be a really, a really exciting day for me. Um, I haven't gone looking for it, but I do know there's this one specific compound that's present in uh, fennel and provides the anise flavor. And so that's probably my first, if I had a choice and I had the money, I'd probably, I'd like to go looking for that. The problem is it is a little bit more expensive, but because of where I work, I have this equipment and these staff, these, these labs at my disposal. And so I give them free honey and they run my analysis and we get along just fine. Uh, a few other ones on here. Uh, what do I wanna say? Butterscotch, a real interesting one, piney. Like I, it's all about how, how much you really enjoy some of these flavors, but I, I like drinking beer. I like to think about how different hops can provide different flavors in the beer. And so I like piney is a good example of a flavor that I can detect and, um, yeah, and so spicy, that's a really good one, but butterscotch is a really interesting one too when you can detect that from your honey. And those can be indi indicative of the different concentration of these various uh, flavor profile, these various flavor compounds that are present in the, present actually in the nectar. So they are of botanical, they also reflect the botanical origin, which I, I find really interesting too. And that said, uh, mead. Uh, so all of this context, all this background is that, as I mentioned earlier, my introduction to mead was to initially just consider how I would be brewing a batch that I would try and keep it simple. I work in a science, I work in, the, in a chemistry lab. I like thinking about science, science questions, and then isolating variables that I can then use to draw conclusions about. And so one thing about monofloral honey and even just thinking about a more restrained amount of nectar sources is that it has allowed me to then think about the other parts of mead making as a craft that I can at least focus on a few simple things before I start necessarily. There are a lot of 
if anybody has a chance, these are the options that are available, at least out of Davis, that you could attend a mead making class. And I've attended, let's see, I attended the boot camp, and I think I'll do the introduction to mead making this year. They're a little bit more, they are quite a bit more expensive. They would require you to travel down there. Not very convenient, and hope, uh, unfortunately, but hopefully that wouldn't necessarily be the bottleneck by which some of you all might give it, give it a shot or at least consider it. Um, they often get into a lot more of the other aspects of mead beyond just the uh, monofloral options or just what you're pulling out of your hive, as in uh, the mead that I'm drinking right now, this uh, Havoc mead, it actually has a really nice uh, ginger addition. And so it's a wildflower out of Vermont, but then they add, uh, they add a ginger component. And then this particular bottle actually also is, um, they add a maple syrup. And so I've been really interested in how back sweetening, if you ferment your batch all the way through, then a lot of times you'll have a dry mead and I kind of like a sweet mead. And so I've been back sweetening at the end and I really like how this craft, uh, this batch that I'm drinking, they back sweetened with, uh, with maple syrup as a really nice compliment. And I put a couple books here, kind of as, this is all kind of a shameless plug page, as in if you want, had some money and you wanted to try and get into it and you haven't yet, um, the books are easy to buy. I kind of listed them in the order that I really like them. Um, and I don't think you'll regret it if you spent 20 bucks on some of these books and they sat on your shelf, um, they've added a lot to how I think about my own batches of mead. And they've also really allowed me to dial in on the parts of the protocol, the method that I really like the best. And that said, I still haven't got very much figured out. So I've read a bunch of books, I've taken some classes and I'm still, uh, I'm, I, I really like what I brew, but I think I've got a lot to learn too. So uh, if you haven't thought about it, and I'm sure a lot of you already have, it's a Fermentation is a biological process that involves yeast and it involves sugar. And as a result of the combination of those two, they, uh, the sugar, uh, the yeast consumes the sugar and metabolizes, uh, it creates both ethanol, alcohol, and it also creates CO2 gas. And so it's a, it's a really well understood process and nice that it can be done under fairly controlled conditions. And just some very quick takeaway, and I'll kind of go through a few of these in a little bit more detail is that um, if you are starting out and you haven't thought about it, it's great to start with sanitized equipment. Um, and so I have a few recommendations on that. As Janine mentioned, I do think a lot about why bacteria don't die, <laughs> as in I wish I could get them to die sometimes and they don't, but sanitizing processes are actually pretty streamlined and I think they're fairly uh, uh, appropriate and applicable. Um, Measuring and adjusting sugar level, like I said, those are those can be done with some simple tools, as in you can measure your, once you've added the water, you've added the uh, honey and water together, usually in a one to three or, or uh, 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 excuse me, a, a three to four, uh, one out of four parts is honey, or one out of five parts is honey, depending on your volume, and uh, adding nutrients is also kind of a standard protocol. I think I've really briefly mentioned to Gene the possibility of some other, uh, do you necessarily need to add a controlled yeast environment? And I've really stuck with that so far, but to be honest, I've found my batches actually to be very, very effective. The yeast is very effective at, at metabolizing the sugar. And as a result, I sometimes end up with, so I mentioned that last bullet there, six to 20% 20, 20 alcohol. If you, boo, if you brew a gallon of mead, and it's 20% alcohol, I often um, don't drink it that way. I usually drink it a little bit more um, I, uh, uh, like a mixer. I actually, I, I kind of like, I like a 10% alcohol or an 8% or a 5% alcohol drink. And so I usually don't drink it that strong, but if your yeast are strong and you've got good conditions then it's not uncommon for you to get that high of an alcohol. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, if you hadn't thought about this degassing, if you haven't brewed before, um, an airlock is a real uh, non non uh, like don't don't think you'll get away without an airlock because it actually is really dangerous to have that high of a pressure in a glass container because it can break and be dangerous. And um, I've noticed this when I've tried to bottle earlier, and maybe there's a handful of you that are brewers and you've bottled a little earlier and then. One night in the middle of the night, you're hearing what you think are bullet bullets going off in your garage, and it's lit, the bottle lids snapping off because of the pressure. And so I typically use uh, uh, metal snapping lids, and 
Uh, I'm really glad that I haven't ever had an accident with high pressure, but I have, I have had my bottles get higher pressure than I need them to be. So interesting to think about what uh, the gas release actually does have a very fairly in, important impact on, on the mead. And timing wise, at, at interesting enough that I, I kind of find that I'm, I'm not, I'm not usually over fermenting. I usually like the residual sugars. And so I don't always, uh, I don't always run it really long. I don't like to think of overcooking it, but that's kind of a preference, a personal preference. And um, I'll, like I said, I'll kind of go into a few more of these details um, on the next couple slides too. Real general, what I kind of just mentioned there that as time goes on in the fermentation process, the sugar is consumed. And so the sugar level does decrease. And then as the uh, yeast are consuming it, then the alcohol increases. And so um, over time, we have the, the, those two, um, those two uh, compound, those two options, those two things switching places. And then I also do an aeration step right at the beginning. I've heard people, a lot of the books would kind of describe that you want your yeast to be happy. And I like that assignment. I like thinking about anthropomorphizing my yeast and what would make them happy versus what would make them not so happy. And so the idea that they're slowly in, they're slowly becoming in an ana anaerobic environment and they might not like, like that as much is the reason why I justify giving an aeration step. I actually do, if I have a one gallon carboy, I'll kind of just give a really gentle swirling. And so I'm allowing some more oxygen to get into the must. Um, that's not that's not necessary, but it's something that I've been uh, more interested in lately. But again, how you take care of your yeast is probably as different for each beekeeper how they take care of their bees. And so I'm one who likes to give my yeast as much as they need at the first step so they're able to carry the process all the way through. Uh, when you're selecting your water, um, that's an interesting option. Um, if you can avoid taking direct tap water, I think that's a smart idea. I have a, a small water filter under my sink and so it's a charcoal filter and I like to think of that as removing a large amount of the chlorine that would otherwise be in San Francisco water. Um, it does not likely remove 100% of it, but I, I do feel confident. Again, my work in water quality, I do think a lot about what fractions are removed by different methods. And so charcoal filtration is really effective. Um, hardness water is okay because you actually want some of those other cations and anions. Uh, addition of fruit and other juices, I think is really awesome. Like I said, I enjoy this, this ginger uh, and uh, back sweetened with maple syrup. Those are really fun. Uh, stabilizers e is an interesting question, how you would do that. The jar, the can that I'm drinking right now, this one for Vermont, it very, it very clearly and evidently says that it does contain sulfites. And so sulfites are, uh, they're used for various purposes, often as an antioxidant, as in they can reduce the oxidizing conditions. And that can be a big impact in wine making if you've ever done that and used sulfites for that, or possibly considered why you did not want wine to excuse me, you did not want sulfites in your wine. And so really interesting chemistry, uh, also very interesting politics, very interesting how people have chosen to go one side or the other of sulfites. And I am gonna mention it briefly today, but mostly under the context of the, the chemistry justification, uh, rather than saying that I'm a proponent of sulfites or not a proponent of sulfites. And uh, finishing. I do this other bottle that I brought, which I love is a uh, hydrin and they are bubbly. And so this is more like a champagne than a bottle of wine and the way that they're able to get those bubbles. So I actually have these two different meads in front of me and both of them are bubbly. The Vermont, want, the Vermont mead is back carbonated as in they introduce a uh, carbon dioxide, they force it in there and then they can it. And that allows the drink, the beverage to also be bubbly and fizzy. But if you add a little bit of sugar, small amount, a small quantity of sugar, usually just table sugar, you have just sucrose to your, right when you're going through your racking process of the mead, you can actually get a last little burst of energy from your yeast. And in doing so, they carbonate, they introduce carbon dioxide into your final product. And that, and so the way that the hydrin, this uh, champagne mead, um, they really describe their bubble, bubbles as being really delicate, like a champagne bubble, and I really dig it. I, I'm not sure that I would, I've done both options. I, do, I like back carbonation, and I also really like uh, uh, priming with a little bit of sugar at the end. 
all preference and maybe you don't even like bubbles. I, I tend to like bubbles because I think it does release a little bit more of the flavors when you're drinking it too. Uh, yeah, let's, I, I like this. And so um, I've mentioned it a few times and it is, it does happen to be a, a, a professional interest of mine. And other than what the screen says, we know that the bacteria, if they're around, they probably will enjoy that environment. And so that's why I do a sanitization step because I want to avoid any biological processes, especially microbiological like bacteria and yeast that I did not put into my carboy, but were present either in the environment where I was working or got contaminated or through the water or all these other steps. And so sanitization is really just a, a seems like a pretty uh, responsible thing in order to get the most out of the flavor of your mead. And I'll go through, I think I'll go through a couple examples here. Uh, before I do that, um, maybe I'll go back one slide for those of you, sorry. Um, sanitization can be the process of both cleaning and disinfecting. And I'm really into disinfection. I'm also really thinking, sorry, on the bottom of my slide there, you can see I've got kind of that flow chart. And so when I think about cleaning, I think of it as a different category than sanitizing. And my best reference for cleaning is that it requires mechanical energy. If you don't spend the time, the elbow grease to wipe off the inside surfaces, then you're, you're only relying on chemical, chemical uh, cleaning and, and, and sanitizing. And so I think of mechanical cleaning as being a pretty easy, um, important step, and I always use it. And people, I like, uh, I like some of the other lectures that I've heard about this. One guy out of Davis who uh, he was providing um, information on cleaning and sanitizing for their mead making curriculum. And when it comes to liquid sanitizers, there are a couple different options. And for a while, I was a little bit frustrated that I didn't seem to be getting a very straight answer. And so I've read these various books and I've thought about what their, their recommendations for liquid sanitizers are, rather than go through a lot of the detail, which Janine has heard when I gave the UC Davis, uh, the, other, the other mead making talk, which is a lot of parallel information. I went through each one of these in a lot in, in a bit more detail. And maybe I'll just say for the takeaway message, there is one that in my opinion kind of comes through, or maybe the first two that come through is, is kind of the clear recommendations. And so I really like phosphoric acid and that I should have written out the brand name. It's actually called Star San, S-T-A-R-S-A-N. And Star San is a, a very readily accessible and a very widely used sanitizer for uh, brewing equipment. And so that's the first one that I listed there. Star San is, uses phosphoric acid to disinfect. And then alcohol, if you have a bottle of vodka or you have access to food grade ethanol, it's, it's in my opinion, it's great because it doesn't leave a residue. Um, of course, it's flammable and you want to be cautious with it, but just the same way that you're cautious with vodka that you would want to not expose it to open flame. Um, and the other reason I really like mentioning alcohol is I think how widely we've all been using it as a result of COVID. And so how alcohol has become, uh, especially ethanol and isopropanol, have become household products in a lot of ways that weren't there five years ago or three years ago, I'm really glad to see how a lot more research has been done, a lot more uh, public health, a lot more education around what those alcohols are used for in the context of sanitization. And so uh, I'll just mention it there. Um, the other ones on my list, um, I'm going to rather than go into the DPA detail, I'll kind of move forward. But if there are questions and follow ups, I'm really happy to talk about those other um, those other disinfectants as well. So, and I see that I'm coming right up on seven. So I'm, I'm, I do have other slides on some of those disinfections, but I think I'd rather go into questions. And if there are questions about disinfectants, I, I can kind of show a few more slides, but in general, to kind of wrap things up, uh, um, I really do like this idea of flowering plants. And I really do like the, of, of pollen and nectar being as unique as the plants that they come from. And we often think about how the flowers on a plant or the leaf structure on deciduous plants or the needles on a coniferous tree, we can use those as methods by which we can identify that tree. And I love plants because they do that in multiple ways. And so not only is it the, the type of needle or the, the cluster of needle, but it, or, or, or the shape of the deciduous tree leaf, it's also the shape of the pollen grains. And it's also, the ratio of sugars that the nectar is produced in those flowers. If 
you're talking about angiosperms and flowering plants. And so I really am excited to emphasize how if you're so inclined and you're kind of curious, you can use some of these tools in order to backtrack what the botanical origin for either your honey or where your bees are visiting. And um, whether or not you can do that with mead, I would say it is interesting and unique when thinking about flavor profiles, but whether or not I can actually isolate and identify that, I need to, I need to riddle Amina Harris with that kind of question, how well we can actually use the flavor profiles in mead to actually backtrack, like I have this carrot. And so how much does this carrot mead actually reflect the flavor of the nectar of carrot blossoms? And it does, it's just interesting what things might make it through that process. Uh, so those are the first three uh, bullets that the sugar ratio is really important. And then this pollen is a really use, an interesting and useful fingerprint. And uh, fermentation, uh, I, I've had some success and I've also found myself not in as much control as someone who works in a laboratory and thinks a lot about having a lot of control. So um, don't be surprised if you're a new mead maker and you have success on one or two batches, but the third one comes out in a way that you didn't. And maybe I'd caution, cautionary tale if you haven't done it already. Like I said, some of my less desirable mead products were actually just kind of hoochie. They were kind of high alcohol. And so all I did with them is I, I mixed them in with a ginger beer, or I, I used them as kind of a, a complement as a cocktail rather than as just, and, and, but maybe y'all, if you like, uh, if you like a, a stronger beverage, then maybe the more than 15% alcohol isn't a necessarily a deterrent, but I tend to, I tend to knock it down a little bit. And then my final comment there is just that I really do like thinking about sanitization. I highly recommend it. And, uh, and this star sand, and I'll write the name of this in the chat menu. So we all have it written down is my recommendation. If you don't, if you haven't tried it yet, it's a pretty useful and easy to handle um, disinfectant. So that said, oh, and these are two jars. Maybe I'll end on a good food award story. Um, beautiful honeys, just such a great assignment. I love working with the Good Food Awards. They recruit honey from all across the U.S. Um, and we taste, so we tasted about, uh, we had, we re recruited about 50 honeys and we tasted about 25 in the day. Uh, my other uh, co-committee uh, member, she tasted the other 25. And last year I did a bunch of floral Hawaiian honeys and Cal California honeys. And this year I did all the other states. And so that was just Awesome. And the two jars here, um, not only we don't evaluate our honey submissions by their presentation, but if you look at these two jars, they're done exquisite, exquisite presentation as in the first jar has been uh, the, they actually, they actually introduced the jars into the hive, allowed the bees to build the wax, and then they backfill it with the honey of the, that hive. And the other one was actually um, harvested honeycomb that is just cut with such like surgical precision. Um, the lady who does this jar is, she does the same jar each year. And it's, it's a great inspiration of how beautiful some of the honey can be. And that second jar is actually a sour wood uh, out of um, Georgia. And it's got a little bit of a reddish hue. And to be honest, it, it's one of my, it's a, it's a lot of the judges favorites honey too. It, it's a really fun and interesting and complicated and yet very mild. Um, anyway, so if you get a chance to try some sour wood honey, I don't think you'll regret it. And it's a great example of honey that is reflecting the a botanical origin. That said, I have references and yeah, I think I'll cut it off here and just go to my, um, maybe I can try and get, I might stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. And it looks like I have questions. So um, should I just read them or maybe, uh, um, Cheryl, Cheryl, um, or Chris, whoever is helping me out here, I could just, um, you let me know what you want me to do. Oh, sorry, Cheryl, oh, I think you're- Cheryl's muted. muted. Um, so let's see, okay. Dick, Dick LaForge would like to know um, what yeast you recommend because you didn't men mention it. Yep. Or do you go natural? Uh, right. I love that you remind me of that, Janine. And I like, uh, I'm a big fan. So I, I do like brewing beer and I like drinking beer. And I think about how uh, sours have become a really interesting niche market for beers. And they're really, I've had some sours that are really celebratory of natural 
natural yeast, natural bacteria. And so I have always, for all of my batches, I have always added uh, yeast. And I started, let's see, I think I started, and I can put these, I can uh, send these out to you later, the specific yeast strains, but I, I started with a, a general recommended uh, mead making yeast. And then I transitioned into a champagne yeast because I was doing that back, that back priming where I, so a lot, there are so many options for yeast and I am not, I would say I'm, I'm fairly lightweight when it comes to uh, offering strong advice there. Um, other than I have not had my yeast inadequate in their fermentation. And so I've only had yeast that have produced and, and, and fermented as much or more than I needed them to. And so I can follow up with you with Janine with just a first order. Here's a product, here's a strain of yeast that uh, you can get started with. And um, beyond that, I guess I would really encourage anybody who's got the, the will to maybe if you're willing, try buy, buy a couple different types and consider how those different types do affect your final product. And from my experience, I haven't seen a whole lot of reason why I would choose a different type of yeast other than I know some folks have very strong opinions about it. Sorry, great question, not a great answer. And Eric, Eric also wanted to know what percentage of H3PO4 do you use for disinfection? Great question. And so the product that you buy, uh, this, so that's the phosphoric acid. When you buy this star sand, I'm just going to write it. I think I can write it in the uh, write it in the chat right now. Sorry, everybody. Good. And so if you buy this star sand product, um, it comes concentrated. And I think I do a. Uh, hmm, I think I take about six mil. Uh, sorry, I take a small, maybe like a tablespoon, and then I dilute that into, I don't know, maybe like a half a gallon. And so these are all very. I'm sorry to be vague, but these are all very clear directions that are written on the container and should be followed specifically. And so there is a dilution. You do buy a concentrated solution and then you dilute it down. And I really do appreciate the question. I often do a dilution in a glass carboy and then I have safe storage as well. Although once you have the diluted star sand, it is not that aggressive. It does have a pH, it is more acidic, but it is not something necessarily that I am very, I, I, you, as with any, uh, as with any, uh, any acidic solution, you wouldn't necessarily want to splash it in your eyes, your mucous membranes, and do you worry about it getting on your sin, skin? And I, I would, I, I actually do like wearing gloves, especially when I'm handling this, the concentrated solution. And because I handle so many acids in my lab, I also, I like using, a uh, 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 safety goggles. I, I think of all the other extra precautions that I'm more cautious about, but there is a dilution. It is very formulaic. It is very specific. And I am very strongly promoting that you follow specifically what's written on the label. And Jessica would like to know what kind of microbes can be found in raw honey, considering she's considering using it to back, or maybe, I don't know, considering using it to back sweetened cider but oh, concerned awesome. about what I would introduce to the finished cider. It's a fantastic question. And so I'll be harvesting this weekend. It sounds like y'all did a harvest not that long ago. I do think of how the harvesting is an opportunity for bacterial contamination, but interesting enough, the, there's a microbiome in the honey gut of the bees. And so they're actually introducing they're actually introducing bacteria into the honey, even within the hive. And so there are very... Uh, it's very difficult for honey or for bacteria to live in honey because of uh, because of various enzymes that produce hydrogen peroxide, because of a highly acidic environment, because of a very low moisture environment. It's very aggressive on the equilibrium of bacteria. And so my initial answer to that is typically not very much bacteria that could be problematic in another beverage. And so I would not be too worried about using it specifically for cider. Um, but as somebody who's really interested in microbiology, I'd say it is not void of bacteria. Okay, thank you for that. And Dick also wanted to know, he said, star sand is pretty concentrated, but you only use two milliliters in one quart of water and use Sorry, that, I guess that, that's that, a statement. Yep, I should have been more, I need to be accurate and I'm not being accurate. And so I would guess that 
it is more than that. It probably is more like a dilution to a gallon, a tablespoon per a gallon. But again, I don't, I, I just shouldn't even give numbers, a very small quantity to a fairly large quantity. And again, those directions are very clearly described on the package. And I okay. really apologize. As someone who is neurotic about methodology and procedure, I'm embarrassed to say how poorly I'm giving estimates there. Please you're, don't take my word on it. No, you're good. Um, so let's see, Eric said 75% count. No, he just went over that. Tamson says, thank you so much. This is a wonderful lecture. What magnification can I use for pollen grains? Awesome, great question. And so I do like, uh, uh, it could be even a high school lab uh, compound microscope. And that allows me to have, so if we think of uh, 40 times magnification, that will get you to the realm of where you can actually see the micro, you can see the pollen grains. But if you can do a hundred times the magnification, then you're actually able to get a little bit more of the morphology. And so I have a couple different microscopes that I use. None of them are that expensive. And this idea of a hundred X magnification is good. If you can get more than that, you won't typically regret it, but I don't necessarily think that that would be obligatory for someone who's just curious like I am. And to be honest, I take a picture of it. Sometimes I never even identify it. I'm just like, oh, that was a little red pollen pellet and so cool and this time of year and I've got a little spiky ball that I'm looking at and I'm excited even without any of the taxonomy I'm just excited to see some new shape and so maybe one out of 10 times when you go digging into these pollen pellets and you get them into your magnification into a microscope or you're able to view them maybe one out of 10 might be very unique in its shape and it turns out that fennel is one of those ones for me in that it is oblong it doesn't look like a little round ball. It has a very unique shape. I can pick it out of uh, 10 other pollen grains if it's all mixed together. And so don't be discouraged if you see a lot of little round spheres and they all look like little round spheres because there are lots of pollen that just look like a little round spheres. But there are some, maybe again, 25% uh, of the pollen that I look at or some fraction are different. And maybe that's just enough for me at this level. And so I. I hope that answers your question. And I really do encourage people who might be curious or someone who might have an opportunity to show uh, a classroom or, or go to a place where young people or anyone who might be interested in it as just a learning exercise. Um, I don't know. Uh, so if you all want to brew, you kind of got to buy the carboy. You kind of got to buy the other equipment to make it happen. Do you have to buy a microscope? It's kind of an investment. And only if you're really into the pollen, but I am. And I think if somebody else would be so even just a little bit more interested than average, it would be an easy investment and can be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is oxalis, oxalis a good nectar slash pollen source for the bee? Yeah. Great, great question. Uh, and I want to know that. And so the fact that huh, really maybe the first caveat is that when I think about identifying the nectar of where I live, I use a I use some filters. I, I know that there's a lot out there and there's a lot that I won't be able to figure out or something that either I don't know how to identify or I'm not able to find when I'm walking around. And the honest truth is that if you think about the various plants that are the, what would be the leading uh, racehorse in the nectar race? And it turns out that there are some plants that just produce abundant amounts of nectar. And so I'm not sure whether or not oxalis is one of those examples, but as you read, as I read more about various plants, I do get a sense of, for example, I think it's lavender is not a very, it doesn't produce a whole lot of nectar. And so even though it's a popular uh, flower for bees or pollinators to visit, it's not as, I don't know, it just doesn't produce as much. And so the more I think about botanical origin, and that's why the question I really like about oxalis is I have thought a lot about oxalis, but I don't necessarily have a great answer to it. But it's interesting that plant characteristics are, you can, you can actually look it up. You can figure that question out. And now that I've been asked it, I'll go figure it out. And if I ever find myself in front of you all again, I'll have an answer. Cheers. And I bet you, you will. <laughs> the photo of your eucalyptus is triangle shaped. There are many species of eucalyptuses in San Francisco. Are they similarly shaped? Do you great, know if great. they impart different flavor profile? 
Oh, so good, so good. And I love it because uh, it allows me to think about not only are we talking about botanical origin down to the species, we're talking about botanical origin down to the family. And so as the question was, is it, are we looking at the blue cap eucalyptus, which is what I kind of, I think that's what the flower, and I think that's what the actual pollen grains on that slide was, was the blue cap eucalyptus, which is a giant tree, a uh, big, tall tree. And, uh, and it has this really, the reason that I really like talking about eucalyptus too, is that it, has a very specific seasonality to it. It's, it's, I guess, from, I don't even know, uh, Southeast Asia or something, maybe, uh, or maybe Australia. And so it grows, it grows at this other time of year. And so we've got flowers on it. Uh, when? Early spring or late, late fall? Anyway, it seems like it's really out of, out of sync, I guess, really early spring. And so it's not necessarily uh, in competition with other plants. And so that's why I really do think of it as an interesting I think I've even seen it as having really nice white when the uh, pollen pellets come in on the bee's legs. I might even have a, like a really nice like tan or um, uh, yeah, almost whitish in color. And so, um, but again, really good question. There are multiple types of eucalyptus and my assumption with that slide was that it was the blue cap, but I do believe that many types of eucalyptus might have that interesting, which is also a unique shape that cool little triangle is something that I can usually pick out from the crowd. Great question. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what volume of honey is generally used to evaluate by microscopy for pollen grains? And does this vary depend depending on how the honey was filtered at the time of extraction? Is If the honey is relatively clear, is there an approximate amount that a lab would start with? Could we do this at home with a solvent or is a centrifuge required? Oh, Mary, I, I could spend some time <laughs> talking. I love that. That's fantastic. And I'm, I'm 100% uh, ready. I love, I love the question. And so the first answer, straightforward, is not very much. And so in order to do it, you actually dilute it first. And then uh, I, I'm still figuring this out in my lab, but I'm fairly certain the way that the professionals do it is that they... Um, they centrifuge, they spin it. So they dilute it and then they centrifuge it. And then the liquid and the solid separate by spinning it very quickly. And then once you can take a small, uh, take the solid off, you basically decant, you pour off the liquid and then you have a very small amount of that solid. It's a concentrated, uh, a concentrated. And there is another treatment step that involves um, uh, sulfuric acid. And so they actually they, uh, it's called acidulation. They actually, um, in order to remove some of the um, kind of the, the, there are other, I guess I think of it like a, like a, a gelatin layer or like this other like kind of this other, these other things that are on the outside of the pollen that if you use uh, sulfuric acid, you can kind of strip them off. And that's where you get these amazing little spiky uh, topography. And so if you do that step, then you're actually able to get, at least that's how the professionals are able to get a higher precision identification. Um, great question about whether or not filtration is going to impact the ability to recover the pollen, and it definitely will. Um, I have thought a lot about, so tomorrow or Friday, no, uh, Saturday when I harvest my honey, I will be using, I was using a 200 micron filter. No, let's say, let me say it, a number 200 sieve Hmm. Dang. So I think it's a, uh, a 400 micron is bigger and a 200 micron is smaller. And so let's just say that I use the, the sieve that has holes that are bigger, allowing more pollen to get passed through into my final product. But there are people that do this 200 and lower. Like I think 200 micron is not that uncommon for filtration, but you can actually even go lower. You can actually skim off even more of the pollen. And so pollen is tiny. It might only be uh, maybe 10 microns to uh, 50 microns in size. And so if you're creating a screen that the holes are, the holes are smaller than, uh, for example, 50 micron, then you're actually capturing the pollen from your final product. You're isolating the pollen away from your honey. And so if you do use some of these more uh, comprehensive filtration steps, then you will lose some of the pollen. You'll lose a lot of the pollen from what you might be going to look for. Nice thing about this method is that we concentrate it. And so we can do a lot with very little in the lab. And so 
as much as the question might be, should you be concerned about filtration if you're actually curious about whether or not you can detect the pollen later? And I think you would have to really do some aggressive filtration before you would really uh, isolate and remove all the pollen. And especially because you do this concentration step with the centrifuge, you actually do get a lot more, or at least you get a lot more uh, available for you to look at, and then you can make conclusions from. And I think mm -hmm. that was it. Uh, honey, clear. Clear is interesting. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that, like, if I usually, I kind of, I don't filter that much. And so I think of mine as usually being kind of uh, uh, chunky and kind of <laughs> opaque. Um, could we do this at home with a solvent? Yeah, uh, great question about sulfuric acid. Uh, and great question about this, when you're handling that uh, star sand, that, uh, that uh, uh, phosphoric acid, also uh, be careful and thoughtful with how you store it. And so where you keep your bottle of vodka is probably, I don't know, not where you keep your table salt or something like that. And so if you do want to try anything with sulfuric acid, I'm not, I, I would recommend all proper uh, uh, lab safety handling, but I'm not that scared of it either. It's not something that I would say, um, warning flag, it's gonna eat through the glass of your kitchen counter or something like that. And so sulfuric acid, uh, which I, I can even, maybe I'll follow up with Janine that process so that um, Mary, you've got, a, you've got a lead on it. And I'm happy to share more because I kind of want to do a little bit more at a, as much as I can do in the lab, I'm really curious to see how it could be applied outside of the lab. And so the ways that I could consider some protocol to be a little bit more deployable, um, uh, Mary, you'll be on my list. Cool. Mary's just full, Mary's just full of great questions. <laughs> um, let's see. Tamson says, "How exciting! What type of glycerol?" Question great. mark. Yeah, great question. Um, where is my jar? <laughs> it doesn't say anything for description as at all. I think that uh, um, I don't know. I mean, I guess we just buy it from a standard chemistry supply shop, but I don't think that really would matter. I think you could probably buy. Like if you can buy it over the counter or you can buy it on Amazon, I think glycerol is glycerol. Um, it is kind of weird to handle. I don't know if you, like it's even food grade. It's usually not too bad. Um, and uh, it just, it's instead of water, it actually, and interesting enough that when you put the pollen in it, they do do some weird like hydrophobic, like they, some, some parts of their liquid like are leaving them in the glycerol, but it mostly just creates a, a it, it's like putting them underwater. And so they kind of, you put your little slide together and you have the glycerol in there in order for them to um, basically be uh, uh, suspended. And they're actually in there. So you can actually get a better view of them. And so if you don't have that, they're usually uh, flat, flatter. I don't know, that doesn't really help. I like glycerol um, and I don't think it's very expensive. And so if you're um, uh, so inclined, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be too hard. And like I said, uh, I would be happy to follow up with y'all if I can think of a way by which it could be even easier and even more straightforward. Because the glycerol mounts are a little bit amateurish in that they give me the opportunity to live in this world under the microscope of these amazing, cool shapes and structures. But uh, when it comes to the way that the professionals are doing it, I don't know if I'm that different. I am somewhat different. Like they still have two or three steps on me. And I think that do they mount theirs in glycerol? They might have something else that they actually use. And so I would say this is a really good first step because it's not that expensive and it's not that difficult to handle. It doesn't require a lab. And so, um, yeah, try Amazon. And I don't think you'll be disappointed. I don't think you'll, I don't think you can go wrong. And he, he says he can bring his microscope to a meeting when COVID's over. <laughs> awesome. Mary has another question. She says, instead of installing a pollen trap, does anyone ever cut out and look at stored pollen in the hive? You're, you're killing it, Mary, you got it. Um, and so when you're holding your frame and you can very clearly observe, again, a great opportunity. If you're looking at a frame on the outside of your brood chamber and you're seeing, you're observing pollen storage inside of the hive, you can go at that with just a little, you know, a little tiny toothpick and just scoop that out and. You, it, it is kind of bee bread. It's not just the pollen pellets, but it's actually, I don't know, whatever else the bees are chewing on. And but there are still there are still pollen grains in that. And the really exciting thing that I think about that question is that you can also be identifying the diversity of pollen based on the color as you're looking at the frames on the outside of your brood chamber. And so if you see 
only two colors, then you can guess that your bees are visiting predominantly two different plants for their pollen. But if you see six different colors, uh, awesome to think that maybe those are six different plants. And the way that I kind of get triggered by that is typically by something that is a different color that I didn't expect, like a really bright red or uh, you know just a color that I wouldn't have even assumed would be in there. And that's kind of the one that I, Mary, I would like have a little jar in my pocket and I would want to scoop that little bright red one out because who knows what that's going to be. And I usually I don't even figure it out, but I'm at least so inclined to, to, to get it started. And so I think that's a great question and a great place to go looking for pollen too. Um, Dick's kept hives in a field of oxalis, but he's not seen any bees on it. <laughs> so right? collect pollen from the flowers and microscope it. I collect did. Pollen right. from the bees and check that out. Yeah, I guess awesome. that was just a suggestion. And a, and a great one. And because I don't think I really, I just saw this field of yellow. Like early in the season, I just had this field of yellow and I saw other native pollinators visiting it, bumblebees and that, uh, that silver digger. I saw that visiting the oxalis, but hmm. my bees, I have a photograph of them and it looks like they're just sitting on a carpet of yellow because there's so much oxalis. Hmm. So I kind of had a hard time. Not, I had a hard time and actually really interesting story on that. Um, Thank you, Dick. Great question. I, uh, my neighbor, who is a he's a beekeeper. Well, he helps me with the hives, and he was doing a project in in the neighborhood, and he found one of those yellow-faced bumblebees that had gotten trapped inside, and so she was a, a queen. She was full size, and she had died after foraging because she had gotten inside, but she still had the pollen pellets on her legs, and so my neighbor and I were like, "Oh, we got to go look at." So that, as Mary said, where do you go? Like aside from the pollen trap on the outside of your hive, you can look for the pollen inside of the hive. Or random enough is I collected this bee specimen, a bumblebee, a yellow-faced bumblebee that still had the pollen on her legs. So I was able to take a little chunk of that, put that under the microscope. And that's where I started because I saw them on the oxalis. But great, great critical thinking, Dick. Like where, huh. where is the missing piece? Did I actually observe my honeybees on the oxalis? And the honest answer is, I don't know why I how did they not stop there? It was like a carpet underneath their hive. Like, why wouldn't they just, if other bees were visiting it, but it really does boil down to this idea of taste and, and color and, and plant preference. And maybe at that time of the year, that wasn't the type that they wanted. It just seemed so abundant that I couldn't, I couldn't let it go. And so really great feedback. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know and, and how we don't really know if there's such a thing as oxalis honey, or if the bees are real, honeybees are really that into it. I know huh. that other bees are. Huh. Um, and or it could be the time of day. I am thinking that uh, before we go any further, John and I would like to take the opportunity to honor some people in our community that have made a big achievement this year. And it seemed very appropriate to have it on an evening when we had a journeyman. California master beekeeping, beekeeper talking about honey and mead. Um, so, John, are you? I'm here. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Mark's a journeyman level master beekeeper, as I am and Janine. And we undertook our journey into the master program. Janine in 2016, I did in 2017. I think you did in 2017 as well, Mark. I did. Yep. And uh, we did this through the California Master Beekeeping Program. Uh, we used the acronym CAMP. And in 2019, they offered their first journeyman level class. And so I think there were about 23 of us that took that, that class and made it to the journeyman level. The next step after journeyman is the master level. And for me, I was I was happy at the journeyman level. I was ready to quit. I didn't want to go anymore. Um, but Janine, you know, she got her teeth into me and kept pestering me and pestering me and pestering. So, okay, Jean, Janine, well, what are we going to do? And what we decided and we were able to uh, arrange through Davis was we could set up a, a, a hub, a satellite camp operation in Humboldt County. And I, I don't know if we're the first satellite camp hub or the second or the third, but we wanted to do it 
um, away from the university setting because we didn't want to be a, a, under their um, thumb all the time. And so our camp capstone was to create this this hub. And, and it's really a little more than that. It, it's a concept we're trying to develop as a club hub so that we they can take what we're doing in any club in California and develop this camp program and start creating master beekeepers. Well, we just finished our first apprentice level group and we were pretty determined that each one of these people was, was not only gonna pass the camp examinations, but also at a high level. And I'm, I'm proud to say everybody passed these exams at the highest level that they could. Now, Dick's the only one we're a little worried about, um, but I think he took his test today, right? Yep. Yep. And so yeah, I probably passed. <laughs> you know, if you didn't, you better not show up here anymore. But anyway, I'm sure you did. And so now we have six new apprentice level master beekeepers in the Humboldt County Beekeepers Association. And they are Mary Benzinger, Christine House. Eric Christian, Hank Harrison, who is in uh, Germany right now. Sir Fitz Drinking is the master beer. beekeeper hey. and Dick LaForge. And so um, I'm proud of all you guys. We ran them through the ringer quite a bit. Um, one of the things we did was submit a bunch of questions to them every couple of weeks and they're they're pretty damn smart people, you know. I mean, we couldn't hang them up too much. And so had to start writing some questions that even didn't have any answers, you know. So and and kind of trying to trick them a little bit, but also wanted to see how confident they were in what they knew and wanted to hear, well, I don't know if there's an answer for that question. And and pretty soon they caught on to that. So once they were getting they picked up on that little trick. It was time to turn them loose. They took the exams, everybody's through it. So now I hope you all appreciate what they've accomplished, congratulate them. The, we want you all to consider becoming apprentice level master beekeepers. I think the application process opens up in perhaps November. Um, and we'd like to see a big group next year. So, and let's give them a big hand. Yeah. Yay. And what does that mean for Janine and John? What would the what would the the, the finish line for a master uh, title look like for y'all? Well, I think we just have to write it up and I think we're there. And cool. actually um, you're kind of in that loop because we want to run by what we produce by you to see what you think and what comments. Anytime. And the idea is to create create kind of a, a template that clubs all over the state or even out of the state can, could emulate and improve on. And right now in Humboldt County, you know, the very first class, the 2016 class, there were seven apprentice level master beekeepers. And I think now there's two journeymen but I'd like to see a bunch of these guys go on to the next step as well. And I think they will. But I'd also like to see it expanded into Del Norte and Mendocino. And we could even do some of Trinity as well. So that's all I have to say, Janine, whatever you want to pitch in. I think you've done a great job of covering it. And we could get back to more questions with Mark. I think that, we, we, that was there, about Mark. it. Uh, Mary wanted us to know that a 200 sieve is 75 microns, but that's all awesome. we had. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, congratulations, Jean and John, Janine and John. Like it's a, I haven't, for those that are still considering what uh, a master beekeeper process might look like, I am, I'm at the stage that, uh, that Janine and John are looking at. And I have yet, like John was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable where I am. I know the project would take some time. And yet I'm also somewhat curious and entertained by what a master capstone would look like. And, um, and so if there are those that are 
that are that are inclined to at least get to the journeyman or stay at apprentice like it is a, it's a it's a great club it's a great group um there are a lot of interesting uh, statewide resources that are available and i'm really happy to be a part of it and also celebrating those that are moving on to the final stage i, I really tip my hat to you mark you have too many interests <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could consider pollen to be something that I'd be writing on. But like John said, that the write-up is, it, it's important, but the, the groundwork, the laying out the plan and executing the plan is even that much more legwork. And so I really, I celebrate your accomplishment. I celebrate your new class. I celebrate those that are, that are moving forward. And uh, yeah, cheers. I'm really happy to be amongst you. Well, we're really happy to to have you and I can hardly wait to you you can travel up here and and visit I was telling Janine that I would really like to brew a batch of mead with her and, and should it get to the stage of consumption then maybe we could all drink it together yes we would love that this presentation has been so great thank you for sharing all this great information that's wonderful and I'll make sure that if anybody has any follow-up, I did notice I copied the chat, but I'll make sure that if anybody has any follow-up, I, I speak regularly, I email regularly with Janine and I'm happy to, I'm happy to take questions and I'll, uh, maybe what I'll do is I can even put my contact, I'll just send it to, is that all right, Janine, if I just send it to you and you could forward it out to the group for me? Yes. Cool. Or you, maybe you already have it at all. I, I'm, I'm happy texting and cell phone is fine. Um, but certainly if you wanted an email, um, I'm responsive and I like, I like all the questions and I, I'd certainly be happy if anybody thought of something a week from now and they're curious to, to hear or talk about it, I'm, I'm in. Great. And uh, maybe I should uh, go ahead and put your address here. Okay, I can do that in the chat if that would help. Yeah, I was just thinking that that might be helpful. And Pamson says, Mark and all my fellow Beaks, you are lovely people. Thank you for your support and for sharing your knowledge. So he's just complimenting everyone. Cool. Uh, so that's my email and send in any, any random thoughts. I'm happy to take them. Any questions, I'm happy to take them. And uh, yeah, let's hang out together. I'm, I'll get up there. And if I can come to a meeting, that'd be great. I'd be happy to do it. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much for coming. It was great. My pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yes, thank you. Yeah, John, good, good to see you. Me too. <laughs> so what, what we can do now is uh, discuss anything we want to talk about. A lot of times we have a designated person to give us uh, the answers to the questions, but have at it. Anybody just chat, ask questions, do what you want. Well, Jennifer asked, where will the video recording be posted? It'll be up on Facebook probably in about 24 hours. Um, I'm not sure that it will be up on Facebook because um, I want to check with Mark. Okay. You'll let me know then? Yes. Okay. I, don't, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I, I was a little cautious, but like I said, I guess I'd rather deal with the repercussions than the the concern. It's so much you. easier to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission. Right. I'm with you. I'm with you. Let's do, let's do that option. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll say something. Uh, in the uh, September uh, American Bee Journal, where is it? There's a really good article um, about uh, flowers and how it's important in the, uh, the beekeeping world and that many beekeepers um, who are, are learning from books or, or Facebook or YouTube, they're not understanding the, the dynamics of how nectar and um, pollen contribute to the health of the hive. And uh, Rusty Burlew, who is um, the owner of the Honey Bee Suite uh, website, she always delivers incredible amount of information. And she wrote this article for the, the beekeepers. And she says, in the old days, um, farmers all had beehives and they understood the dynamics of um, having flowers and when the nectar was available and having multiple different kinds of flowers. And she thought it was a, a big oversight in many new beekeepers that they don't have that understanding of 
botany and uh, plant materials. So I thought it was a really good article. So if you haven't read it, it would probably be helpful. I like I, res I like Rusty Burlew anyway. She always has an interesting perspective. She always is pretty funny in, in what she writes. And she is a master beekeeper also from the Pacific Northwest. That was this most recent? Uh, yeah, it was September issue. Okay, I have a comment, um, if you don't mind. Uh, today, Jean and Ian and I went to extended education and talked with the people there who wanted to talk about the B classes for next uh, spring, mid-February. And so, uh, of course, nobody knows if we're we'll able to have classes in a classroom, uh, but they would certainly, practical beekeeping would certainly be a uh, Zoom or Canvas class that anybody can take from anywhere like we did last, well, this spring. Um, there was also talk about um, recording the class and putting it in a form so that the university can basically, uh, and with our uh, backup, uh, give the class uh, at different times of the year periodically um, in a remote way so that it could reach any, anybody anywhere could really take it. So uh, we think we've got a good thing going, so that's being explored. Um, but that's about all we could say about it right now. We're really hoping that uh, uh, we can do the more advanced class where everybody gets together and visits bee yards because we think that's where the real learning takes place once you've got the basics. Um, so we're hoping everybody gets vaccinated and uh, this thing calms down so they'll let us do that. Anything to add, Janine? I think you did a great job. Well, we're... And thank you for, for putting it out there. Yeah. I well, like the field trips the best, too. Yeah. I'd say our weak spot is um, a field trip and on hands-on mentorship after the class is over. And that's where we've always been hoping the club would uh, pick up the ball. So... Um, and organize mentorships, but uh, we will hope that happens. Yeah, um, this year, Janine encouraged me to help one of the um, new beekeepers from your class um, who bought a nuke from Janine and I to be her mentor. And I would say I didn't feel completely up to the job and leaned on Janine a lot for the questions, but I learned a heck of a lot just being her mentor by going in the hive and helping her um, refine her skills and answer her questions and have to look up the questions in the books that I needed to give her the correct answer. So I, th I think it's a win-win a for people who um, be mentors for new beekeepers. So I was grateful to have done it. So thanks, Janine, even though I was grumbling a lot. We've talked about <clears throat> mentorship at the state level as well in California Master Beekeeping, and they actually just got me set up with a mentee here in San Francisco. And I, I do find it interesting that it does require both, uh, it requires motivation on both sides, both the mentor and the mentee, and how those aren't always that formalized. And maybe, Chris, that's your comment too, like how does the mentor, what are the, what are the assignments the mentor should be giving and 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 how do you know what the mentee needs and so those are those are good riddles i think they're felt throughout and there's also something that's just really nice to hear that you benefited i i'm ben, i really enjoy my mentee um and she's a new beekeeper but she's also a veterinarian and so she's thinking about how that is a new niche opportunity for veterinarians across california so she's quite capable but she doesn't know how to do uh, basic mechanics of the hive. And so it's been fun to have kind of a constructive assignment list, which is basically handling and maneuvering. And so how mentors find those balance, I, I don't know if any, I don't know, I'd say we're all kind of, we're all in a similar boat with you of how, how do you feel confident and what, what is the successful completion of that? And each mentor and each mentee seems like it's kind of unique in its own way. And 
the fact that you're taking away something positive, I guess I'd say is you're right. That's what makes it a win, a win-win. Right. And I think that you have personalities that might be uh, a good sync and sometimes it might not work. So fortunately, this one was uh, positive. It worked, it worked out well. So I, I think it's um, worth everybody trying to do it. Even if you don't um, do it for the whole season, if you just uh, bounce around and help people with just some basic issues, I think it's valuable. I like. So um, I'm a relatively new beekeeper. This is Mary. Um, and at one point, I recall there was some sort of article, uh, maybe it was in scientific beekeeping, about um, a club that had somebody was recommending a, a certain levels of organization for for mentoring. And one of those included having the newer beekeepers, like maybe after taking the class talking amongst themselves to resolve questions and those kind of like helps percolate issues before reaching out to the mentor. And I, I feel like that is something that I would enjoy having and would have to take advantage of and it would help me clarify my questions and maybe we could all help each other solve very basic problems before going to the mentor or mentors. And, and maybe that's something that could be formalized with the class or with our apprentice program or the club, um, it's got potential. I, I agree, I think it would be helpful. Also, maybe just having um, it like a committee for the uh, organization where people can submit their questions and ideas on a regular basis, I don't know. It would, it would keep the same mentors from being inundated. True. And then I also wanted to share something I tried out this season was a single form of pro pad treatment of hives. It was something we talked about. It did not work, especially for my larger hives. I, am, I did a second round of treatment with the full dose. And so I think I would still do that again with tiny hives. But um, my mite count was still like almost like I did nothing on one hive. Um, I mean, the population had increased. Maybe it would have been worse otherwise, but I came out a week after at 8.4% on one of my hives. So this weekend will be, I, I need to check if I've got one more week post-treatment or, or if this is one week post-treatment on the second round, because uh, I'll be assaying again. But I just wanted to share that I tried the one Formic Pro pad and I did not like what I saw, especially with my larger hives. Mary, I ended up uh, using two pads for this, you know, one pad, and then I went back and changed it to two. <laughs> I, I want to, if you do your mite counts again, I'm curious to see what you find. If, if you do, I'll be doing three. them this week. Okay. Also, I, I think I might want to borrow your hive lifter at some point, so I'll be getting in touch with you. I'm not looking forward to that, but. <laughs> if you're talking about that, uh, that hive lifter that looks like you use two people, it's like a giant pair of tongs. There's one uh, that came from the McMullen donation that I have at my house too. Oh, yeah. yeah you're gonna did you also say you had a bag or a yeah. net bag? I have a net that can be put too. over the entire call, you know, hive so yeah, that when you yeah. put it in your car, you won't have to worry so much about bees flying around. Yeah, so much. Uh, Chris and uh, Janine and John and uh, Cheryl and all, thank you. Uh, I think I'll sign off and I really appreciate the opportunity. I had a really good time. I will be back in touch. Janine has been a fantastic contact and I do look forward to hanging out with her again before too long. So thank oh, you all good. and have a great night. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate Mark. It. Good night.
We yeah. look forward to it too. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. And I'll look forward to chatting with you soon. I'll be in touch. Take care. Okay. Does anybody have any more questions they don't want to talk about? I, I guess I have one comment. I've been getting, you know, people are doing their um, discovering what happened after they did their mite treatments and sometimes needing queens and whatnot. There was a notice out from Man Lake that they're selling queens. That was about a week ago, but the latest report is that they don't have any now. So as far as I know, um, there's no queens available unless you get them from Oliveras in Hawaii. Um, so I hope everybody's hives are have nice queens and uh, lots of honey on them and no mites or very few and you're all ready for winter because it's obviously changing very fast right now. Right. If you if they need anything, any food, this is the time to do it if you haven't already because it's still warm enough for them to process their uh, sugar water. I, anyway. I am feeding my my uh, colonies. And have been for a few weeks. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to sign off too because there's other things. Uh, I got other things that are going on, but um, I want to thank uh, John particularly for his study sessions. I thought they were uh, really well done and quite helpful. quite helpful in taking that test. And uh, all I've got to do now is uh, uh, what? Uh, explain how I'm not going to start fires with my smoker and my alcohol. And then yeah, don't fire. get. Oh, no, we don't, don't want fires. <laughs> don't get your veil on fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just uh, after I took that test, or you know, read through the the um, module for a couple times, I thought, "Geez, I've, I'm always putting my." Uh, smoker on the ground. Wow, I'm so F minus. It's like I don't hook it on the hive. I'm always putting it wrong places. Well, we you know, the first state, the uh, hot, dry, grassy fields that are in the rest of the state. I mean, well, yes, the, the lady that wrote that that stuff lives in Southern in Irvine. Okay, and that's where they have that. Uh, it's, it's like a farm that the university on research farm, South Coast Research Center, I think. You know, of course, they'd just gone through all these fires. And so they came up with all of these rules and regulations. That's part of the reason I didn't want to have anything to do, do with Humboldt to have a, you know, our camp Humboldt satellite. But, you know, you burn a house down in Irvine, probably going to be a couple million bucks here you can burn down the whole damn block and the, you know we probably won't get that far so around here it would probably wouldn't stop at one block <laughs> yeah and sometimes it'd be a good thing that a couple blocks burned down but anyway you know so they, they're just so overly cautious about everything that i knew i i wouldn't do them and probably most of you guys wouldn't do them either, but that's where that all came from. But I'm kind of curious, um, how did you find the exam? Was it, I mean, pretty simple or? Oh, uh, since I just took it, you mean? Well, all uh, you, you did take it, you had. Yeah, I yeah. thought it was, I thought it was quite good. Um, it's basically a, a, a general knowledge exam. It's not a uh, how do you deal with situations. No. Exam. They're not trying to teach that. Uh, no. But as far as, uh, uh, you know, basic stuff, I mean, they're considering you're starting and you need to learn the nomenclature and the concepts of what, uh, you know, what different, uh, let's say, all three casts of bees do and you know, that kind of stuff. I thought it was a, a fair exam. I thought um, the time allowed was not too little or too much. Um, if you didn't really know your stuff, you didn't really have time to look all that stuff up. So you've really pretty much got to know it. Um, so um, I, I was, uh, you know, I was, I'm pretty positive about it. Okay, good. Yeah. I mean, 
I think it's a good, I, it it's wasn't a good too job. easy. It wasn't incredibly hard. There were a few questions that stumped me because I thought too much about them. Um, but I felt that I was prepared for it. And if I hadn't done the preparation work, it would have been difficult mm -hmm. I, the, because it included enough specific things that we had prepared for. Um, so I felt that what we had done beforehand was highly useful. Well, I think everybody that did it uh, had the B class. So that you've already had like 22 hours of uh, B talk and concepts and vocabulary and all that. So I think the, the study materials would be uh, basically a review. It's not like you're starting over with them. And, and then some of the, it filled in some of the stuff that we don't really do in the class, like the definition of honey and, uh, um, you know, all this kind of uh, <laughs> more, more, uh, more um, the integrated pest management. I, I know honey comes in uh, honey bottles, you know, I know what honey is. Yeah. But, you know, it's oriented towards the, the industry and the entire state. So to me, that's fair enough. You know, yeah. if you're going to be in the food business, honey people get in the food business, that definition is carefully worked out and it's, okay. you know, legally. Um, so uh, just because we're stuck here in Humboldt County doesn't mean that all that stuff is, is uh, you know, it might not be important for us keeping our bees, but if we're going to be well-rounded beekeepers, well, that, that's, we should be, you know, this is a good look into the wider world. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Good.